am Jeffrey Barda. I am the Assistant Deputy Director for the Navy's Navy Museum Division here in the Naval History and Heritage Command. It is my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Captain Todd Glasser, who is currently the Chief of Oper Naval Operations Chair uh, at the uh, National Defense University. Captain Glasser's career began in 1995 uh, when he graduated and was commissioned an ensign from the Virginia Military Institute. Upon completing flight school and being designated as an unrestricted naval aviator, uh, he served his first fleet tour uh, with HSL-51 forward deployed in Atsugi, Japan, where I was fortunate enough to have him as the maintenance officer for my own detachment, Detachment 4, on board USS Chancellorsville CG-62. Upon completion of that tour, uh, he served numerous staff tours at the Naval War College and on the Joint Staff J-7 before assuming command of Helicopter Strike Helicopter Maritime Strike Squadron 71 at NAS North Island, California. After completion of other staff tours, including Naval Forces Central Command, uh, he transferred to the National Defense University, where he is currently, again, the Chief of Naval Operations Chair and the Senior Navy Representative uh, at the National Defense University. Today's topic is U.S. Navy float planes and the changing character of World War II Pacific aviation combat. Uh, as a helicopter pilot uh, in the Navy, uh, I'm very interested in this topic and I hope you will as well uh, because I truly believe it is the, the genesis and the birthplace of modern day helicopter operations and shipboard operations outside of, uh, of carrier operations itself. So uh, without further ado, uh, Captain Todd Glasser. Chief, thank you for that introduction. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about, and I fully admit, a, a pretty dusty quarter of, of U.S. naval aviation history here. We're going to be talking about not what, 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 uh, what Jeff Barton just said of uh, aircraft Corsairs and, and, and Hellcats taken off from aircraft carriers. Rather, we're going to be talking about seaplanes that were catapulted off of the back or maybe even a midship of uh, cruisers and battleships uh, in the U.S. Navy during the war. They would perform whatever their tactical mission is. We're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, and then land in the water alongside uh, the ships to be craned back on board. Uh, we're going to take a look at this kind of dusty corner of, of naval history through the lens of a concept called character of war. The idea that there are timeless military, or in this case, naval functions that need to be performed, but based on conceptual or technical changes, uh, the way that a military or a navy goes about accomplishing them changes. So uh, that's kind of be our lens, and that's going to be our guide as we go through uh, this kind of uh, eclectic time. This is the order we're going to talk about in. We're going to talk about, first of all, what kind of war did U.S. Navy planners during the interwar period, what did they think a future conflict with Imperial Japan might look like? Then we're going to get into what the war they actually found themselves in, and of course how they adapted their float plane forces uh, to meet both requirements. So those are going to be some takeaways from that, from the modern strategies. The concept of the character of war is very much on the minds of, of strategists and policymakers today. Here's a quote. Uh, from our brand new chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General C.Q. Brown, said this back in September when he was still uh, still chief of staff of the Air Force, and he's quoting a air power theorist, General Duhay. <clears throat> but what he's saying could equally apply to other war fighting domains, including the Navy. And what he's saying here is that it's not enough to adapt to the changing character of war, but to really be effective, you need to uh, you need to anticipate it. Well, hopefully by the time we're done with our talk today, we'll kind of show that's kind of a hard thing to do. And the majority of our talk is going to dwell on that second part of how you adapt what you have to a changing character. The reason that this idea of changing character of war uh, is on the minds of strategists and policymakers today is, is instances like this. This is the Russian cruise of Slava, changed her name to Moskva, the fall of Soviet Union. 1970s, 1980s technology, a wonderful anti-surface and anti-air uh, platform. You see those big anti-ship cruise missiles on the side of her. And of course, she sunk on the 26th of April, 2022, in the Black Sea by the Ukrainians, not by tactical aircraft, 
not by Ukrainian surface ships, rather by the asymmetrical combination of a drone swarm to confuse her radars, combined with a barrage of organically produced anti-ship cruise missiles, changes in the character war. This concept of the character war, and as a, as a war college professor, uh, I'm obligated to talk about Karl von Clausewitz. So uh, he really does encapsulate the idea. Here's a quote from his seminal work on war. Uh, we can hear echoes of General Brown's quote in it. Clausewitz goes on to, to kind of bifurcate war in kind of two qualities. It says it has an enduring nature and a changing character. This enduring nature, these qualities will apply whether or not we're talking about a war today or whether a war in Clausewitz's time, which was the Napoleonic era. So he's going to say that war, regardless of either, is always going to be described as the product of the chance for victory that's provided by your army, the clarity of the policy provided by your government, in other words, why you're fighting, what do you want to get out of this war, and lastly, the passion of the people to sustain the burdens of combat. This is not what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about what I talked about in the intro. And I bring this up because Clausewitz permeates these circles so much. Right? Instead, we're going to be talking about this idea, like you said, that there are, there are timeless functions that a military or a Navy has to fill, but that based on technology and ideas and things like that, it changes. So we look at Clausewitz's time, for example, uh, the need to find out information about your enemy, where he is, what, how strong he is. Well, in Clausewitz's time, you would send men out on horseback. They would ride out, make contact with the enemy, perhaps fight for information, and then ride back and tell the commander. As time goes on, came aerial reconnaissance and photography, even further on, electronic warfare and support measures, and of course, overhead imagery. But of course, we're, we're not going to be talking necessarily uh, about overland campaign and the application of information and the need to find out information. Rather, today we're going to be talking about the application of fires in the maritime environment. In other words, how fleets sink fleets. So we're going to really narrow this down to the Pacific theater in World War II. Let me start this story. First thing to to, to think about or to note is that this is not what pre-war planners in the 1930s thought a future conflict which Imperial Japan would look like. It's a painting of the Battle of Jutland in 1916 and the idea that there'd be two lines of massive battleships colliding in Duke Japan. Rather, pre-war planners had a much more nuanced idea of what a future fleet engagement would look like. They envisioned a, a, a battle in which the, the combat effects of battleships and submarines and aircraft carriers and aircraft would all be combined uh, to synergistically uh, attack an enemy fleet. You see an example or a picture of how that would look in the center of that. That's from the USF-10, a uh, United States Fleet Publication 10 uh, from 1938, a piece of interwar doctrine. What interwar planners did get wrong, though, was that what, which of those platforms would provide the plurality of the destructive effects. They thought it would be the battleships, the battle line would, would provide the, the plurality of those effects, and that the aircraft carriers and the submarines would be in support of that effort. And they had reason to get that wrong, or to think that. The, uh, <clears throat> the broadside from a single Pennsylvania-class battleship in the 1930s, Pennsylvania was the flagship of the Pacific Fleet, could deliver 20,000 pounds of ordnance out to a distance of 15 miles. And she could do it at a sustained rate until her magazines were exhausted. As a matter of fact, in 1935, a study by the U.S. Navy War College uh, found that a three-ship battleship division could destroy a single capital ship in as little as three minutes. In contrast, the same Navy, that same year, 1935, the standard Navy dive bomber at the time, that's a Martin BM-2, could deliver 1,000 pounds of ordnance and it could do it out to a range of, a of uh, 200 miles, but it would take her two hours to get there. Times two to get back, plus time to refuel, rearm, etc. As a matter of fact, for most of the interwar period, doctrine actually recommended against the uh, application or the employment of carrier forces, carrier air forces, uh, against a battleship division operating in close proximity to another, or to each other. In other words, within interlocking anti-air systems. 
So as a result, doctrinal evolution during most of the interwar period revolved around the question of how do you increase the combat effectiveness of the Navy's battleship forces. More specifically, how do you increase the accuracy and the range for guns. One way they did this was to experiment with aerial spotting, in other words, to send an aircraft up aloft to tell the ship whether or not their shots were falling left, right, far, or short of the target. First major experiments with this were done in 1919. That's Kenneth uh, Whiting, who served in the NAS Pensacola area. Uh, NAS Whiting Field is named for him. And he conducted tests with Battleship Texas. She's uh, depicted in the middle. And they found in these 1919 tests that it ranges outside of 20,000 yards or 10 miles using an aerial spotter could increase the accuracy by about 200% over what shipboard spotters can do. It also allowed them to extend the range of those shots past the horizon now to about 15 miles I talked about in the last slide. <coughs> Whiting testifies to Congress uh, immediately following the test. Uh, Congress is uh, very taken with the results. And as a result, uh, Josephus Daniels of Cup of Joe fame was uh, Secretary of Navy at the time orders the installation of aviation facilities on all of the fleet's battleships, heavy cruisers, and light cruisers. And our era of float planes on ships begins. So important as the 1920s turn into the 1930s uh, was aerial spotting to, uh, to, doc to doctrinal planners that carrier air groups were actually charged with protecting uh, friendly spotting aircraft during the fleet engagement and attriting fleet and gate the uh, spotting aircraft of the post, that's an F3F fighter from the late 1930s. So how would they how would they plan on doing this? Well the operational model, <clears throat> they would match uh, a battleship division to a observation squadron and each uh, squadron would put two to four of its aircraft on each of the uh, division's ships and that would be two to four crews as well, a crew consistent of a pilot in the front and a radio and gunner in the back. They have a maintenance footprint of about 20 men, so roughly about uh, what a helicopter detachment in a, uh, in a cruiser or destroyer is today. Tactically, you can see uh, depicted on the right-hand side, that's from uh, USF-16, another piece of interwar doctrine from 1935. And you can see it's a very sporty idea. On the left-hand side uh, is the friendly battle line. Uh, to the right is the opposing battle line. And the idea is that these multiple squadrons, a group, if you will, of, of uh, spotting aircraft would launch off, go to the engaged side, go past the, uh, the opposing battle line, and spot the fall of shot from there. You can see the interlock <coughs> with carrier air groups here as well, they would need for protection. So tactically, uh, it was risky, that, and it had risks that needed to be, to be mitigated. Operationally, it was also, uh, it was also risky. This is an OS-2U Kingfisher. Uh, it was the most widely produced uh, float plane during the war, uh, and you see kind of the operational model of how they were going to uh, of how they were to be used. They were catapulted off uh, again, either midships or on the fantail. Depending, depending on sea state, the ship would then have to make a wide turn to smooth the sea for the for the aircraft to land behind her. And you can see a reason you would need to do that in a picture of a Kingfisher landing next to USS. Uh, North Carolina in 1942. Once she landed, she would then taxi up uh, and hook onto a sled that would be uh, drug behind the ship. Once they hooked on, pilot would cut his engine and his crewmen would then reach out and walk out onto the uh, wing route and assist the ship's crane to bring her back on board. Uh, extremely hazardous evolution or the best conditions would take about 30 minutes to accomplish. Uh, and by the time Pearl Harbor happened, most float planes in U.S. Navy fleet service had experienced some type of damage from just operational mishap, usually either during the landing phase or while being craned back on board the ship. Operational overhead, uh, if you will, a lot of surface officers were reticent to use them. Here's a quote uh, from the name Durfelt. He was the uh, senior aviator, what we call today the officer in charge of the float plane unit uh, in Battleship Arizona right before uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. There's SOCs that he references. That's a biplane uh, float plane that was used a little bit earlier. It's actually used throughout World War II uh, in cruises. And you see it depicted there at the, the bottom left part of the screen. 
but there's this reticence to use them because of the operational burden of employing them, regardless of the tactical, uh, regardless of the tactical advantage. Of course, that's the war they thought they were going to fight. Events of, uh, of the early war period showed that something different uh, was in the off, a different way of fighting. There's everything from the British raid on Toronto on the left-hand side, of course, the raid on Pearl Harbor in the middle, and most tellingly, the destruction of the British Task Force C, uh, HMS Prince of Wales, and Repulse off Singapore in late 1941. And what pre-war planners didn't account for in this idea of a changing character war is how much technology had changed. That's an SDB Dauntless dive bomber, a standard US dive bomber, beginning part of the war, in her service in 1940. If you were to compare her to that Martin BM-2 from just five years before, she could carry 20% more ordnance and she could do it 100 knots faster than the BM-2. A change in the character war was in the offing. And the Navy had to come to terms with this. Where they tried to conceptually come to terms with this is an organization called the General Board. General Board is a hybrid organization of, of retired and active duty officers uh, who kind of who consider these high level, um, these kind of high level uh, matters. They tackle this one uh, in a monograph called The Airplane and the Battleship. Uh, it's presented to Congress in October of 1942, so a full five months after the Battle of Midway, six months after the Battle of Coral Sea, and in it, they actually recommend a continuation of the synergistic uh, approach to a fleet engagement. And the reason they do that is not that they're ignorant of things that had happened over the first, uh, first 10 months of the war, but rather they look at examples like Pearl Harbor or Toronto and say that is simply the idea, or that's simply an illustration of a carrier force taking a battleship, uh, a battleship fleet by surprise at anchor. It is carriers being carriers. They're supposed to be decisive and fast, and that's what they did. Destruction Task Force Z is a little more problematic. They do acknowledge it uh, in the monograph. Uh, Task Force Z was destroyed uh, at sea while maneuvering and alerted with a destroyer escort. It was a fair fight. Uh, but in the monograph, they can simply say that not yet uh, is known enough about, uh, about the task force destruction. Of course, what does that mean for our, for our enablers of surface combat and battleship combat? Or picture of the Kingfisher. Well, in a lot of, uh, as in a lot of stories, uh, bureaucracy gets a vote when it comes to the government. We'll talk about the actions of two, uh, of two uh, organizations, uh, the Bureau of Ships and the Bureau of Aeronautics. The predecessors of what I have here on the board, but the two things, the two organizations are responsible for procuring uh, surface ships and, and airplanes for the Navy during this war. <clears throat> and in late June 1942, the Bureau of Ships has a problem. Uh, looking back on the Battle of Midway, which had happened just three weeks prior, they were instructed by the Chief of Naval Operations to increase the close-in anti-aircraft protection on the Iowa class of battleships, which were then under construction. The problem the Bureau of Ships had was that they had already reached the topside weight limit for Iowa class. They needed an engineering trade-off. What they came up with was to remove the aviation facilities, the cranes and the catapults from Iowa class. They write a letter requesting this uh, to the uh, Secretary of the Navy through a couple different organizations. And the first one it comes to, of course, is the Bureau of Aeronautics. Unsurprisingly, the, Aeronautic, the Bureau of Aeronautics does not concur with removing aircraft from any ship. Uh, and their, their argument is thus. <clears throat> they point to the past 20 years, going back to Lieutenant Commander Whiting's experiments of um, of tactical innovation and development with placing an aircraft on a ship and the synergy that comes from that and say that really just after six months of war is that enough data or information to actually change how we do business. That's the first argument. Second argument is they cite their own battles. They point to the 1939 Battle of the River Plate off uh, Montevideo, Uruguay, in which the German battleship Grass Fay whose float plane had been disabled, scuttles herself in the face of an inferior British cruiser force whose float planes were operable. 
both the General Board, of course, who's writing the monograph at this time, uh, and the Secretary of Navy agree, and the float plan and float plans are retained on board the ships. But bureaucracy, which is part of it. Another interesting thing to, to consider, perspectives. Perspectives matter when you're considering the character, changing character of the world. In the same time frame, a little bit earlier, maybe March of 1942, the senior aviator, again, it's the officer in charge of the float plane detachment, in uh, Cruiser New Orleans, who, by the way, is a lieutenant at this point, writes a letter to the chief of naval operations, who, as today, was a four-star officer. Writes a letter uh, recommending that float planes be removed from all cruisers. And the reason for that is he's looking at his SOC, uh, his biplane fighter, and he says, you know what, in a war that we're now in, this aircraft is not capable of his words, fighting, fleeing, or striking. In other words, flight, shooting down other aircraft, uh, trying surface targets, or, or fleeing it in the face of superior aircraft. Uh, of course, his operational experience in March of 1942 has been limited to three escort missions in the Eastern, uh, convoy escort missions in the Eastern uh, Pacific. As with the uh, Bureau of Ships letter, this one has a chop chain, or has a chain uh, which, uh, of approval that has to go through. Uh, and it comes to this man. This is Jack Fletcher. It comes across Admiral Fletcher's desk two weeks after he returns from commanding Task Force 17 at the Battle of Midway. It comes across his desk because he also has an administrative role as the commander of all cruisers in the Pacific Fleet. So here's a man who has actually seen the new face of combat. He's one of four men in the world to have actually commanded fast carriers in combat. The letter comes across his desk, and he recommends against it. Or he recommends for the retaining of float planes, and he does it for this reason. So in other words, Admiral Fletcher didn't disagree with the lieutenant. Right? He didn't think that SOCs or float planes were capable of fighting, fleeing, or striking. Right? But he's saying that I've seen the new face of war, and no one's asking them to do that. And, and uh, CNO and Gerald Board were up there. So float planes are retained. They're retained in doctrinal publications. On the left hand side, you see war instructions for the US, U.S. Navy's fighting instructions from 1944. Uh, and even later than that, uh, the USF-10B, it's another, probably it's the Navy's piece of doctrine that is published the latest in the war, 1945. Both of these publications call for the use of float planes in surface-to-surface -surface combat of battleships or cruisers fighting each other. Uh, float planes also make their way into operations plans. Uh, plan 2942, which was Pacific Fleet's plan for the Battle of Midway, uh, explicitly warns against action against action by Japanese fast battleships. Implicit in that is to be prepared for float plane action. And on the far right-hand side is Admiral Willis Lee, probably the most prolific U.S. Navy battleship commander during the war. His O plans throughout the war uh, call for float plane employment. His relationship to float planes is, or view of float planes, is actually pretty complicated, so if anyone wants to talk about that QA, I'm more than happy. But that's doctrine, right? And that's plans. When ships actually fought ships, such as off of Guadalcanal in 1942, 1943, U.S. Navy float planes were absent. They either stayed on their catapults uh, or they were flown off. And the reason for that is they were not fought, these battles were not fought under the conditions that pre-war planners thought that the U.S. Navy would be fighting, namely, they're at night and they're at, at close range, extremely close range, by the way, 10,000 yards and in. These are naval knife fights, five miles, for example, uh, in. Because of the interwar uh, naval limitation treaties, the U.S. Navy had anticipated using their tonnage advantage that those treaties gave them to fight a daytime, long-range engagement. And that's what the float planes had been procured and trained to. So they were not used to this engagement. They were not prepared to fight this, uh, these fights whatsoever. Uh, the U.S. Navy also had the advantage of radar during a lot of these flights, and I can get into that relationship of float planes and radar as well in Q&A if, if you're interested. Uh, to the extent that float planes were used during the Guadalcanal campaign, the naval Guadalcanal campaign, 
uh, largely would be launched the day after uh, major battles to find cri crippled Japanese ships, um, and they would talk friendly U.S. or friendly destroyer squadrons onto them. Uh, interestingly, uh, that's a picture of New Orleans uh, about eight months after the lieutenant sent his letter, and she's missing her bow after one of the uh, one of the battles off Guadalcanal. It's up there because uh, there's kind of a provisional squadron that's created in Guadalcanal from the aircraft and all the ships that were damaged during those fights uh, and undergoing repairs. They put them ashore, or in harbor, I suppose, in Tulagi, uh, and they do wonderful work, specifically, uh, or especially with PT boat squadrons, but going out in front of them, finding, sorting, and targeting uh, Japanese ships for the PT boats. It's actually so successful that once New Orleans and the other ships are repaired and, and they take their aircraft back, uh, the Navy establishes a permanent scouting squadron in Tulagi Harbor, Scouting Squadron 64, uh, to continue that work. So the U.S. Navy didn't use their float planes um, to any great extent during the Guadalcanal campaign, Guadalcanal campaign. The Japanese Navy, however, did. And the reason is because they did anticipate or trained to the conditions under which uh, those battles were fought, close range at night. And it was for the same reasons. Because the Washington and London Naval Limitation Treaties locked the Japanese into a tonnage disadvantage for battleships, uh, they foresaw the need to engage in attritional attacks, close range, light forces, at night, leading up to a major battle line engagement to get those numbers down. Uh, and this is pretty much exactly the conditions under which uh, Guadalcanal was fought. And float planes were part of that, and then to, again to find and target, uh, target U.S. forces. Another effect on float plane procurement, and that is that the Japanese came to see carriers uh, as all purely offensive weapons much more early than did the U.S. They couldn't afford to have, for example, scouting aircraft come off of their carriers, they needed them to be carrying bombs and torpedoes. As a result, they moved that mission to their float planes that would be on their battleships and, and cruisers. So whereas U.S. spot float plane aircraft were solely in the spotting role, so you need a, a slow aircraft that has good on station time, the Japanese needed something that could do that, but was also fast and survivable. And you see that in the uh, Ayachi A-13 uh, Jake float plane in the top right hand portion of the screen. Uh, it was their most widely produced uh, float plane. And she could do uh, 70 knots faster than the Kingfisher and she could fly, about she had a service ceiling about 15,000 feet higher as well. They're not necessarily gonna fight, uh, but uh, SOCs and Kingfishers will run into float plane versions of the Zero in the Illusions campaign. Uh, and it, the uh, Zeros are going to either shoot them down, drive them off, and then to, uh, to add insult to injury, uh, they start spotting counter battery fire against the invasion, invading U.S. Uh, US uh, fleet. But everything I've talked about to this point has been about float planes enabling surface to surface combat, this old way of fighting that we had anticipated happening sitting in the 1930s looking forward. Surface-to-surface -surface combat didn't play as big of a role in defining Pacific, in the Pacific War as did amphibious warfare and, uh, and fast carrier task forces. So you're going to see that at the same time that the Navy keeps their aircraft or their float planes positioned to guard against a possible reversion in the, in the, uh, in the character of war, they also adapt to these new ways of war at the same time. Biggest way for the, on the amphibious side, it's to spot naval gunfire ashore. Uh, it leverages all the advantages that they had uh, with spotting gunfire against other ships. <clears throat> this became very mature, and uh, as the war went on and became part of their standard training track, as a matter of fact, a float plane pilot by the end of the war in 1945 uh, would go to the U.S. Army Artillery Center at Fort Sill and would spot about 560 rounds of live fire before ever even hitting the fleet. They would also get an introduction to uh, land warfare while they were at Fort Sill, and that was so they could fill the role of command and control and liaison during amphibious operations. 
especially useful during the Battle of Tarawa when those are the invasion of Tarawa when those communications largely broke down. Uh, because these aircraft did have wonderful on station time and were low speeds, uh, they were good at finding uh, camouflage uh, enemy emplacements, they were great at finding mines, they dropped leaflets because they were spinning or orbiting over top of an amphibious objective area, they were great at providing in indications and warnings of uh, incoming Japanese airstrikes uh, as well. As the fleet. There's a lot of these quotes uh, that you see on, on the screen here. This is uh, from the CEO of Battleship Massachusetts. He's talking about gunnery strike here off of Japan, uh, but I could pick up the after action report of any amphibious campaign and find battleship commanders saying similar. Life is different for a uh, for a float plane pilot uh, whose ship was escorting fast carriers. However, uh, <clears throat> all that operational overhead that we talked about of, of maneuvering and time that it would take to launch and recover them largely precluded a lot of their operations. As a matter of fact, in 1943, uh, that's a picture of Battleship uh, Alabama uh, Museum down in Mobile. Uh, her float plane detachment only flew on an average about once every three weeks during the entire year of 1943. Uh, morale plummeted as a result in comparison to the, uh, the float planes that are engaged in amphibious warfare. Proficiency when they did have a chance to spot gunfire short was not very good. It's not until they're adapted to the mission of combat search and rescue that they really find, uh, find their stride. It becomes, a, it becomes a percentage mission. Nonetheless, even though they, uh, the aircraft were adapted to fill these missions, that operational overhead remained, and doubts about their survivability persisted. These aircraft are, are very slow and they very have low ceilings. So as a result, the Navy looked for alternatives to them throughout the war at the same time that they were, they were using. The first alternative they looked for <clears throat> was to remount their pilots uh, in, ta in more survivable aircraft. This happens in North Africa. Uh, it happens in, uh, throughout the Italian campaign, the picture that I have up here is the pilots of Cruiser Spotting, Spotting, Cruiser Spotting Squadron 7 in preparation for the invasion of Normandy uh, actually go ashore and are retrained in Spitfires and fly the first month of the invasion in Spitfires. It, it is very effective, it works wonderfully. Uh, unfortunately, that predicates on the fact that you have time before an operation to retrain your pilots in a completely different aircraft and that you have a land-based airfield in the vicinity. Second idea was to train fighter pilots to spot gunfire. Uh, there's one squadron in the, uh, in the Atlantic and one squadron in the Pacific, VOC-1 and VOF-2. Uh, they fly a variety of aircraft, mostly Wildcats. Uh, again, very, uh, it's very successful, but it is predicated on a carrier operating in the vicinity. There's no organic spotting camp. The last idea that would solve at least a survivability issue would be to, pr to procure a more survivable float plane. And they do this with the Curtis SC-1 Seahawk. Uh, enters service in late 1944, early 1945. Seahawk can do 200 knots. He's got a service ceiling of 39,000 feet uh, and has a rate of climb about 2,000 in excess of 2,500 foot per minute. As a matter of fact, she can outclimb a wildcat that those VOF, uh, VOF2, VOC1 pilots uh, were flying. The wildcat's actually in their training syllabus, and each uh, Seahawk pilot would do about 50 hours uh, in the wildcat in preparation uh, for, for, for flying the Seahawk, for meeting the Seahawk. Even more importantly, though, <clears throat> is what I have circled in red here. Is that the Seahawk mounted a radar? That's an ANAPS three uh, radar. Vastly increased their effectiveness in uh, in the scouting role. Now you see the float planes moving beyond the gunfire spotting and into more of a Japanese style scouting mission. So if you think about when the requirements for these were being, uh, and I've gone through them, uh, were being refined in the early war period. I think of an aircraft like the Seahawk in, off of Guadalcanal in 1942-1943 would have been a wonderful asset. Uh, would have been survivable. It, by the way, also had a rudimentary uh, autopilot to enable the pilot to go head down and work his radar um, to maintain surface surveillance and know where the Japanese.
Japanese art. Ditto for scouting in battles like Coral Sear and Coral Sear Midway. Unfortunately, though, because it is a fighter-style aircraft that has been procured to meet 1942-1943 requirements, the one thing she can't do is combat search and rescue. And by the time she hits the fleet, late 44, early 45, the Japanese Navy post Leyte Gulf is re reasonably or has been destroyed, uh, eliminated, as, an, as a credible surface and air threat. Combat search and rescue and gunfire spotting ashore and the missions that need to be done, and she can't do one of them. Eventually, they do modify uh, the Seahawk with a cot in the fuselage so she can uh, carry one or two men. So she can do the role, but it's not, uh, it's not as clean as it could. So the Seahawk solves the survivability issue, but it doesn't solve the operational pain issue of using these aircraft. And as a matter of fact, there's, there's one last uh, gasp or one last attempt to remove the, the uh, float planes uh, in July of 1945 as the Navy is ramping up for what it thinks is going to be the invasion of Japan. The commander of Cruiser Division 18 writes a letter to the uh, Chief of Naval Operations requesting planes uh, be removed. He cites all the arguments that uh, that had been used before. He adds one new one though. He attacks the Bureau of Aeronautics argument from way back in 1942 that there is a synergy, there's a teamwork that's fostered by putting a spotting float plane on the same ship as, as, as she's spotting for. Uh, interestingly enough, this, this commander dismisses that with, with uh, the idea that he says that we have been spotting gunfire in combat for three years now and that the standardized tactics, techniques, and procedures have become so refined that this is really a plug-and-play mission. He wraps this up. Uh, it's not even going to get to see those desk until October of uh, 45, in other words, so after the war is over. But before that, it comes across uh, this man's desk. Uh, that's Admiral Jesse B. Oldendorf. Uh, he's the commander of Battleship Division One of all the Pacific Fleet's battleships. Uh, at the end of World War II. He also has a distinction of commanding USS, U.S. battleships in combat for the last time against other battleships. Uh, he recommends that the float planes be retained, uh, and the reason he does is simply the idea, the idea that carriers or, or, air, or land based airfields won't be around. So he recommends this approval. And that's eventually what happens. This is how the Gerald Ward uh, endorses it in March of 46. You can see this goes back to. Uh, to Jeff's introduction of kind of the inkling of where these tactical tasks will be headed. So we look back on this one. Kind of for the for the contemporary naval strategist or, or, or policy policymaker. Now hopefully what we can, we can take away from this is that this transition from battleships to carriers was not an on-off switch, or at least it was not perceived as an on-off switch. It was a gra rather gradual transition. So you see decisions being made about specific weapon systems that are simultaneously anchored in the old way of fighting, battleships v. battleships. At the same time, those same systems are being modified for the new character of war, for spotting gunfire, shore combat, social rescue, etc. Perspectives matter. Contrast uh, the lieutenant on the New Orleans, his frustration uh, with that of Admiral Fletcher, and they're both actually in violent agreement about the capabilities of the platforms, but they've seen different views of the conflict that's coming. So they reach different, uh, different conclusions. Bureaucracy, of, of course, always gets a vote. It's, uh, everyone has their own parochial views. Uh, procuring to all requirements, that's the story of the SC 1. The aircraft would have been wonderful. 1942 and 1943. Unfortunately, by the time that it hits to fleet industrial age weapon systems uh, by 44, 45, it's not as uh, effective as it could have been. And then lastly, the importance of conceptually sound doctrine. That inner work, those pieces of inner war doctrine that I cited, uh, in which the, a fleet synergistically combines the, the, the destructive effects of all their platforms was still very much in effect at the end of World War II. The ratios, the, the contributions of different, uh, different platforms changed, but the basic structure of it did not change. It was flexible enough to be agnostic of individual, of individual, individual technology. 
So, hey, I, I appreciate your attention, and I think we have a, a couple minutes for Q&A. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment. Uh, recently, the trade literature has been uh, speculating on new float planes, if you will, this uh, wing and ground effect. I'm not an aviator, but do you see there's uh, any future in this? Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, with new float plane uh, technology. That's awesome. By the way, it's like patrols, like patrol navy. No, this is a uh, wing. Actually, would, as pictures, they're just the pictures. It'd be rather large aircraft, which uh, don't get out, uh, do not uh, 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 escape from the uh, wing and ground. They, they're low on the uh, over the surface of the water and they use that uh, extra propulsive effect to, uh, to uh, maintain a altitude above the water and go long distances, carrying uh, usually uh, troops and cargo. Oh, like an elk hack kind of thing? Well, <laughs> ish. Ish, but an elk hack certainly is on the surface of the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a just a ground about effect. Uh, it's about yeah, 50 feet off the water. Very cool. travel long distances. Certainly, I think I would have more questions for you well, as, not, as, as like we, we go on on this. I I, this sounds fascinating. I'm not an aviator. So yeah. I'm um, with all this stuff, and and of course the reason we're giving this talk right now is that is that we are perceiving ourselves to be at a inflection point in the changing character war. Systems like that, uh, absolutely fascinating. I'd like to hear more about. Yeah, it, it, it's a it's a way of delivering men and material, not necessarily weapons delivery. But uh, absolutely, like if you consider what just happened off of uh, off of Yemen uh, in the last week, right? You're seeing the combination uh, of both very high-end technologies of uh, the combat uses of the Aegis weapon system, uh, alongside uh, bomb dropping F-18s, just like it's 1986, right? Uh, so I would be curious to see maybe on the higher end of things if that uh, Marine Corps course is. Uh, change is messing with their own force design issues and how that will play. I'm curious on the, the role of spotting yes. and in today's um, uh, aircraft operating from surface ships, um, maybe an HSL pilot could address it. Do they undergo any type of spotting training? You mentioned uh, in the, uh, back in uh, World War II that they spent a, a period of time at the Army's artillery school. Do today's uh, shipboard aircraft um, operators go through any kind of spotting training? So it, it's still a task in training uh, in our training right, readiness matrix, matrices, uh, absolutely. And then a certain number of crews uh, go through SCAR training uh, and FAT-H, uh, for air controller uh, training uh, as well. So no, uh, not, um, not, JTAC, not to level of being JTACs, uh, but to spot uh, Absolutely. I would say editorially, uh, it's not a mission that they train to a lot. Uh, and I can think of over the years different um, administrative and bureaucratic reasons for that. But I guess to answer your question is that it's still a vent in their training rhetoric matrix. Absolutely. How much it's addressed, that's, that's great. Thank you, Captain. Great talk. Um, as background, you know, I. I saw the transition from the early LAMPS days to LAMPS Mark III separately doing one tour and then another uh, from a very simple helicopter to a much more complex helicopter with expanded missions. You lived the transition from LAMPS Mark III to HSM with the same airframe but suddenly huge exponential growth and capability. Uh, where do you see us going? Um, are we biting off too much? To more than we can chew, you know, are we becoming too multi-mission, um, which would reignite the, the debates back in the 30s and 40s over, over the platform? It's a, great, it's a great question. I think questions like that are, are wrapped up into the future of manned aviation. So, um, you know, to what extent, you know, do you want um, manned, manned weapons delivery platform or manned sensor platforms? Um, it's a, uh, it, it's a great question. That's where I would put that. And if you ask what the next generation of sea control helicopter uh, or gunfire spotting or, or something like that, uh, my first question, if I was in power, and I'm certainly not, uh, I would say is, hey, can we do these missions with unmanned systems, right, with, with less cost, uh, 
everything from uh, ROTC scholarships to uh, gas and flight school. Uh, so yeah, yeah, if, if you can adapt them to that, absolutely. The, uh, I've been uh, doing a lot of research on Saipan, and one of the observations on the Battle of Saipan is that uh, the new battleships came in there and did a pre-bombardment and weren't very effective. Uh, and you talked about the Alabama and the uh, lack of uh, you know, use of their uh, uh, float plane. But the old battleships, when they came in, they did their pre-bombardment, very effective. And I think you got me thinking that this might be the reason why. Absolutely. And there's actually um, and another aspect of the story which could um, which goes right along with what you're saying, is what was the Navy going to do, another story, what is the Navy going to do with its old battleships? Uh, and uh, fast battleships can escort uh, carriers, etc. But there is, a, there is a conversation about what to do with them. They eventually arrive at this idea that they're, they're going to be gunfire, uh, they're going to be amphibious gunfire platforms. That's their main training. So your answer to Saipan is absolutely everything from the men in the plotting rooms to the air crews that are spotting the guns, that this was their primary mission, uh, which is in contrast to you saying, hey, do you guys still do any gunfire spotting today for helicopters, right? Wonderful contrast, um, so uh, absolutely. Just a follow-up question, uh, the impact of uh, escort carriers in Leyte Gulf and on, uh, do uh, the escort carriers take on spotting roles? Those two uh, tactical squadrons, two fighter squadrons, VOF2, uh, VOF2 and VOC1, uh, that's where they were. Ba that's where they were based. They were. They were envisioned as that kind of uh, that kind of thing. I was curious if any of the navies used float planes as sort of a deception in terms of sending out a float plane, hoping that it would be seen, and then complicate the opposing fleet's consideration. Like, oh, we've been seen now, and so adjust their approach or anything. Back of my mind is a specific uh, instance of that, and I'm trying to think of if it was during the, the Aleutians campaign. But a cruiser force was sent earlier in the war east to operate and radiate, uh, and of course there's an evidence of um, you know if, if you see a float plane that, that that is draw your circle right that that's there has to be a major surface force. I'm trying to think of an exact example. Uh, I can probably get back to you though, because I've heard it. I also, though, do know uh, of instances in which float planes were not operated because they didn't want to betray the uh, presence of U.S. ships. Absolutely. That absolutely happened. Great questions. Good questions. Awesome. Well, cool. I'll stick around if you have any more questions. I appreciate it. This is really good. Thanks for your time.